<clears throat> Barbara, I want to thank you for this uh, honor to be up here. Uh, <clears throat> not only the greatest broadcaster, all-time broadcaster in terms of all of his abilities, but uh, probably the finest gentleman any of us have ever had a chance to meet. My first exposure to Dick uh, was on January 20th, 1968. Houston against UCLA, Wooden against Lewis, Kareem against Hayes, 71-69. The first regular season nationally televised game in the history of college basketball. And oh my, the voice of that game, Dick Enberg. It's the first time I ever heard him, and I said, that guy's pretty darn good. <laughs> a few years later, that same genius, Eddie Einhorn, had put that game together, put together a game between UCLA and Maryland. Lefty Drizel said he was going to become the UCLA of the East, and that was a nationally televised game. Andy, your brother, played in that game. Uh, I was working for a guy named C.D. Chesley, who was not a friend of Einhorn's. But I had also worked for Einhorn, which was very unusual. I probably was the only guy that ever did that because they hated each other. In the morning of that game, I was called to breakfast to meet with these two fellows. And I sat there and I wondered what was going on. And, and uh, they told me that uh, they had a problem. Einhorn said he's bringing that hot shot from the West Coast. A guy named Dick Enberg is going to be the play-by-play -play announcer. Chesley said, no, it's going to be Jim Thacker. He's my man. And they said they've come up with a solution, and that is I'd be doing a half a game with each guy. Now, I knew Jim Thacker extremely well. He was a real gentleman, much like Dick. But I did not know the hot shot from the West Coast, who by this time had made quite a reputation for himself. So I said, wait until this game, we get this production meeting. I can't wait to see this guy tell Einhorn he's going home in a rage. And so I had my eyes focused on him, and he came in. I had never met him but I watched it. And when they told him that this is the way it was going to be, he never batted an eyelash. He looked over at Jim Thacker and he said, Jim, this is your home turf. Would you like the first half or the second half? And whatever one you pick, I'll be happy to go down on the court as a sideline reporter and help out any way I can. He said, man, well, I, this, is, this is some guy. So we worked together in the second half. And about two minutes in, I said, he's special. He's really special. Well, I hadn't seen Dick for that, the rest of that time. I basically only met him for that half a game. And that summer, I got a call from NBC, and they said they're going to start doing regular season college basketball uh, on a weekly basis. And they wanted to know if I'd be interested in being the, the analyst. And I said, sure. I, I've never had an interest and still don't to this day to ever being a broadcaster, but I like going to games. So they said, there's one caveat. We have selected the play-by-play -play man, but uh, we want to give him the opportunity to select or be part of the selection who he wants to be his partner. They called me back two days later, and I'm thinking it has to be Kurt Gowdy because I'd worked with Kurt Gowdy in the national championship, and he was the key man at NBC. And Scotty Connell called me and said, Billy, he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, but you're on the team. And he said, Dick has decided when we asked him who would be his partner. And I said, Dick who? And he said, Dick Enberg. And I only was with him for a half of a game. I didn't even know the man. And he said, here's what he told us when we asked him the question to pick his partner. He said, if you're going to guarantee that every game is going right down to the wire, I don't need a partner. I can handle the games, but we all know that's not going to happen. So he said, I'd like to pick a guy that I worked half a game with. And he said, I want to work with Billy Packer. That's how I got my chance to be a broadcaster and a team member of Dick Enberg, having worked just a half a game with him. It was very interesting to, to do that, and right away we hit it off extremely well. And two years later, after we'd done a couple of national championships, NBC, in their great wisdom, decided to hire another guy named, as we all kicked around today, Al McGuire. I didn't like Al McGuire. Dick liked everybody, but he didn't know Al McGuire because Al McGuire didn't care who Dick Enberg was. 
So in the fr and when NBC came out that year with the press announcement as to the broadcast for the year, they never mentioned Al McGuire's name. So the first game we ever do together, or we think we're doing together, Al McGuire never shows up for anything that we're doing, a game, but they say they're not going to put him with us, they're going to put him in the locker room with a monitor. And Al's going to do the halftime report, and he's going to, during the course of the game, push a button. When the light comes on, he's going to tell you something important that he's seen in the game. Dick and I are sitting there, the first half goes, the light never comes on. At halftime, Al McGuire does his halftime piece. In the second half, the light never comes on again. And Dick said, Billy, in his very humble way, he said, Billy, let's go find out what happened. Maybe it didn't work. So we go into the little room where they had Al, and there was the monitor, and there was the janitor. And we said, uh, where, where is Coach McGuire? The guy said, he left at halftime. <laughs> so Dick said, this will never work. I said, no kidding, but I was kind of happy, to be quite honest, because he was a pain in the neck. So the next game, we get there, and Al shows up, and we say, we go over and introduce ourselves, and, and we say, hey, how would you like to sit with us? So he comes over and sits with us as a threesome. NBC had nothing to do with it. We announce the game, and he's not very good, because he's not paying attention. Now, none, neither one of us knew that he didn't really care about basketball. And so that game ended, and, and Dick gives me the credit for, for bringing him out there in the first place, and I'm kind of annoyed that he's hanging around. And Dick says, I'll tell you how we're going to make this work. This is how brilliant Dick was. And I said, how's that? He said, we're going to put him in the middle. And they did. So Al, I said, why are we doing that? He said, that way I can keep him alert as what's going on in the game. And he said, I know what you're going to do, so I don't have to worry about that. And that's how it happened. The three of us were working. When the season ended, everybody said, oh, this is tremendous. NBC is so brilliant putting this together. It had nothing to do with it, all right? And it turned out everybody loved the way we're working. And the season ended, and Al McGuire sent NBC a bill for $30,000. And they said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I announced the games. You didn't pay me to announce the games. You paid me to do the halftime and push the button. And NBC didn't know what to do, but they knew that he became so popular that they had to pay him. Dick and I never got a damn cent of that $30,000. That, that is the way that our association started. And you know how Dick loved a good meal. Al never went to lunch or dinner with us at any time. So we're doing the Final Four in St. Louis. And it's, it's Easter Sunday. And I'm a Catholic, and I go down to the chapel right underneath the, the Great Ark. And I'm going up to communion, and I look on the side, and there's some homeless people sitting over there poorly dressed, and, but I'm, I'm so proud they're there. And as I turn around, I realize Al's with them. And he's all ratted dressed, and uh, I'm thinking, what, what is this deal? This guy's nuts, I, but that's a, at least he's in church. I never even knew he was a Catholic, even though he coached at Marquette. So after church, I walk out, and, and there he is on the steps. He says, Let, you want to go to lunch? I really didn't want to, but you know, I'll go to lunch with him. And we walk on the, on, on the river. And all of a sudden, the, the, the boats are out there, and he hollers to a guy, and he says he's with the health department of St. Louis. Let me on the boat. So I'm following the guy. What are we doing? So he gets there, and he said, I'm here to inspect the kitchen. We go down to the kitchen. He looks around a little bit and says, how about making us lunch? We, we have lunch, and we walk back out, and he, he says, nice seeing you, and away he walks. So I see Dick a little while later, and Dick says, where have you been? I thought I was going to lunch. I said, I went at the lunch with Al. Now, I've never seen Dick with, the, with a frown on his face. And, well, why wasn't I invited? I said, well, let me explain to you where we went to lunch. <laughs> so that, that is how that, that group kind of worked together. And it, it was amazing uh, how it all worked out. And I, I will tell, I wasn't going to tell this story, and I don't want to bore you with, I can stay here for hours to talk about it, but Bob Costas is not going to get a chance to speak. So I want to tell you how Dick Enberg, not only my career, but almost everybody he touched, he helped their career. And I wasn't going to tell the story about Bob, but, but Bob, as we all know, is also one of the greatest broadcasters in, in, in the history of sports. But Dick Enberg, wanting to help Bob Costas out, decided one game, unbeknown to the network and unbeknown to Al and myself, he's going to give, he's going to give Bob a chance to be the broadcaster of a game at the University of North Carolina. Now, I, have met, I had met Bob before this. Al doesn't watch basketball or anything else, so he had no idea who he was. 
Bob doesn't show up for the practice. But we go to dinner that night, which Al hated because Dean Smith went to a nice restaurant. Al never went to a restaurant. He always said you could tell the good restaurant by the dirt on the ankles of the waitresses. Okay, that, that was his. So you can imagine how did Dick and Al have this great relationship. So we go to dinner, and they're talking basketball, and Al is really annoyed now. Fancy restaurant, and we're going to talk basketball. And this guy down in the end is asking a lot of great questions. And Al looks down at him, and he said, uh, hey, fellow, what, 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 what do you do? And Dean Smith looked at Al like, what are you, crazy? This is the guy that's going to be broadcasting the game. Al didn't get it, and I didn't tell him. So the next day we do the game, and unbelievable, the game, they hold the ball, and the game is over with a 30-minute time delay. And so we have to go back and forth. And so I'm having to throw it up to Bob, and I'm having to throw it up to Al. And Al is referring to Bob Costas, the great Bob Costas, as Yellow Pages. He doesn't know his name. But we get in the car to go back to the airport, and I'm really embarrassed for Bob, who's done a great job. And I said, Al, Al, what, 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 the, what was that all about? He said, what was what all about? I said, Bob. He said, who's Bob? I said, Bob Costas, the guy we work with. I said, you kept calling him Yellow Pages. What's that about? He said, well, I don't think he could see over the railing well enough, and he needed a Manhattan Yellow Pages to see the game. <laughs> so thanks to Dick Enberg, and you've got to admit it, Bob, had it not been for that, that was the first national televised game he ever did in his lifetime. And it was really amazing how Dick touched all of us. And Annie mentioned about working with him. We all know about his great voice. We all know about his great preparation. We all know about his great interest in the game. But I think the thing about Dick more than anything that for me was the fact that he had the greatest set of ears of anybody that ever broadcast play-by-play. -play. And the reason for that is the superstars in sports are guys that are not only great themselves, and confident in what they can do. They also make their teammates better. Uh, we think about that, the Magic Johnsons, the Michael Jordans, the, the Bradys. Dick Enberg was that as a broadcaster supreme. And anybody, and we all know, we're all sitting out there, a number of us, we all know that that's what he did. He listened, he studied, and he made you better because he brought you in because he listened so beautifully. That's what made him something special. We talked about the play tonight, and that bond between Dick and Al was something special. And he had the bucket list, he wanted to do that play. And as, we, as has been mentioned here, he was a brilliant writer. And he was so proud of the play. And he called me after the first, the first show, which was up in Milwaukee, and he said something unbelievable happened. He said, as he, Tony was standing up there in, in the first act, a moth came down from the sky and sat right on his shoulder. And he said, that had to be Al. And uh, I didn't think much of it. So a few months later, they brought the play to Belmont Abbey College in North Carolina, where Al started to coach. And my wife and I went to the play. And in the first act, a moth came right down and sat right on the shoulder. Dick had not only written the play, he had orchestrated something that I really know happened, and Al was there. I want to thank you, Barbara, for inviting me to be here with all these great people and to share a, a pleasure with the finest broadcaster that's ever been, probably the finest writer of sports that's ever been, and the greatest gentleman that I have ever had an opportunity to meet, the one and only, oh my, Dick Enberg. Thank you, Dick.